Welcome to Smyrna Christian Church, where the entire Word of God is taught straight from the Bible. Good evening. Welcome back to Smyrna Christian Church. Going to get into another round of questions today. Of course, as we always say, never take my word or anyone else's word for what they say. Like it says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, Study to show thyself approved, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So let's get into it. Let's ask a word of wisdom from our Father. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. And in this place you've given us, we can teach your word. We ask you to guide us through these studies with your Holy Spirit. We ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear to understand and teach your word. We ask that your words be spoken and your will be done on this study. Thank you and we love you, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, amen. All right, first question we have Stephen from Texas. I've always questioned if Moses wrote all of Genesis or just part, maybe. I am unsure. Do you know of any evidence that he did? And yes, Moses absolutely wrote all of Genesis. He, Moses wrote all of the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And that's what is often called the Pentateuch. And I'm going to give some scriptures that will document that. Acts chapter 3 verse 22 will show you that Moses wrote Deuteronomy. Mark chapter 7 verse 10 will show you that Moses wrote Exodus. Romans chapter 10 verse 5 will show you that Moses wrote Leviticus. Numbers chapter 33 verse 2 and Ezra chapter 6 verse 18 will show you that Moses wrote Numbers. And then so what about Genesis, which is your question Make note of Luke chapter 24, verse 27. And this is our Lord and Savior speaking after the resurrection, where he was talking to a couple people who they didn't even realize that it was Jesus Christ at that moment. But Jesus Christ, what it says that Jesus Christ began to do at that time is that beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He began to teach them all the places where Jesus Christ was prophesied of in the Old Testament. And it says that he began at Moses, at the teachings of Moses, that is. And where's the first prophecy given? Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where God says to Satan, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed, and your seed will, shall bruise his heel, and, and her seed will bruise your head. And so Jesus Christ began in to, to explain to them those prophecies. So how it says that he began at Moses, that shows that Genesis is the writing of Moses. So all five of those first books written by Moses... And you can also see in Luke chapter 16, verse 29, it says they have Moses and the prophets. And as well as in uh, Acts chapter 28, verse 23, speaks of out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets. And those places, and I'll mention one other, Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 1, where it says they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses. So many times when it speaks of the book of the law of Moses, it's referring to the Pentateuch. All, all of those first five books of the Bible, it's referred to as the law of Moses. So all those things combined, that will show you that, yes, Moses did, in fact, write the entirety of the book of Genesis, as well as those other, all five, first five books of the Bible was written by Moses. But of course, who really wrote it? It was Almighty God, of course. It might have been penned by Moses, but those are, are the words of our Heavenly Father, as is the entire Word of God. Michael, we don't know where Michael's from. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 24, and Revelation chapter 19, verse 20. Is this the same fire? And you, you wrote out um, both of those verses, so I wrote them down as well. I'll go ahead and read those. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 24 says, For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. And then Revelation chapter 19, verse 20 says, and the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, 
with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And so you're asking, is that the same fire? And now I, I would not say that, that God is the lake of fire. I mean, I wouldn't put it that way. But God is a consuming fire. And it is true that what happens when you get cast in the lake of fire? It's a, you no longer exist. And you can see it in uh, Psalm chapter 37, verse 20, how it says that how they're like the fat of lambs and they go up and they consume into smoke forever and ever. Once again, that means you no longer exist. And you can read about in the death sentence of Satan's soul in Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 18 and 19, how it says, A midst of fire from within, and uh, never shalt thou be any more. That's what it said to Satan there in that chapter. So to be thrown into the lake of fire, that means that you no longer exist. And I want to mention, it says the beast was taken. And what is the beast there? That is a role of Satan during the tribulation before the deadly wound. The political beast. And you can document that in Revelation chapter 17, verse 7 and 8. And then the false prophet that is a role of Satan during the tribulation after the deadly wound. And you can document that in Revelation chapter 13, verses 11 through 18. So th this is speaking of when Jesus Christ returns, is what the, the subject of Revelation chapter 19 is. When Jesus Christ returns, Satan will no longer have the ability to use a political role and as well as a one world system, he won't be able to deceive people using that. And he will also not be able to disguise himself as Christ anymore. That's to say when Jesus Christ returns. And you know, for the thousand year teaching period of Revelation chapter 20, Satan will be locked in the pit for the thousand years. But then he'll be let out at the end of the thousand years at the, at the end. And he will have a chance to deceive people, but he won't be able to disguise himself as political role or religious role. But he will, everyone will know he's Satan. And that's why if people follow him at the thousand years, at the, at the end of the thousand years, those who follow him, they will be cast into the lake of fire and they will die the second death which is the death of the soul, which means their soul will perish, which means they will no longer exist. And you can make note of Matthew chapter 10, verse 28 as well. And I want to read one more verse, Revelation chapter 21, verse 4. And so Revelation chapter 21 and 22, that's after the millennium. That's when Satan and all those who followed him are done away with and they no longer exist. And that's why it makes sense that Revelation chapter 21 verse 4 says, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. There will be no more death, there, there is no more lake of fire, there's no more sorrow, all the wicked no longer exist. And we go into that perfection, that third earth age, that... Like it says, no more sorrow, no more death, but perfect happiness forever and ever. Praise God. <coughs> Excuse me. No, we don't know the, the name of this person. <coughs> Excuse me. I am perplexed because I have always thought that Isaiah chapter 11 verse 6 said that the lion shall lie down with the lamb. Is this a common thing? I mean, it literally freaked me out a little. I honestly remember this even from my childhood. And th that is a very common thing. It, it's said all the time that, it, that it's written that the lion shall lie down with the lamb. It's one of those things that many people say, but it's not actually written. And that's why, you net, like I, we always say, don't ever take any man's word for what they say. There's a lot of things like that that you hear all the time, but it's not written. And what, it, what Isaiah chapter 11 verse 6 does say is, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. And this is referring 
to when Jesus Christ returns. And where that, that's, that's the millennium, once again, that thousand year teaching period of Revelation chapter 20. You don't have to worry about a lion or a leopard or anything attacking you. It would go on in the next couple of verses to say how, the, I believe it says the lion will eat grass like the ox. And even in the first five verses of Isaiah chapter 11, it speaks about the branch, about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. <coughs> Excuse me. And it says, um, and then I'm, I also want to skip down. I want to read you Isaiah chapter 11, verses 9 and 10, where it says, They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. That's our Savior Jesus Christ. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. And Jesus Christ is our rest. So that, Isaiah chapter 11, it does speak about when during the millennium, everyone will see Jesus Christ. They will know that he is the true Messiah. And like it says, the knowledge, everyone knows. And there's no such thing as faith at that time. And that's why if they do follow Satan at the end of the thousand years, they will die the second death. So Isaiah chapter 11 is a beautiful chapter. We can't wait to get to that time. But remember, we have work to do. We have work to do in this time in the flesh and during that thousand years. And you read in Revelation chapter 20 that those who stand against the false Christ, you will be priests and you will reign with Jesus Christ through that thousand years. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> One more question. We have Lois from, Virgin Lois from West Virginia. My boyfriend said he read in the Bible that angels only help people that they want to help, that God doesn't send them. Is that right? Are there verses that say this? And no, I'm sorry, but that is not right at all. And I'm going to give you a few verses the first I'm going to mention is Psalms chapter 91, verse 11. And it says, He shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. And that's a very beautiful and important verse. You might remember that's the verse that Satan even tried to twist in Matthew chapter 4 when he tried to tempt Jesus Christ. But so that shows you that the angels, they can't do anything without God say so without God giving them that charge. And then Matthew chapter 18, verse 10, it, says, it speaks of don't, don't despise the little ones, those who love God. You better not despise them because it says, in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. So you see, the, the angels are watching out, but th they have to go to God. And God does give them the charge. God is the one that sends them. And then, <coughs> excuse me, Luke chapter 1, verse 19, Gabriel himself says, I am sent to speak to thee. So it's God that sent Gabriel. It's God that sends the angels. And then Hebrews chapter 1, verse 13 and 14 says that angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be the heirs of salvation. <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry. So that, there it shows right there, the angels are sent, and God does send the angels. So, no, that would be absolutely false, um, what, what, what was said in the question. No, the angels don't just go around doing whatever they want, no matter what God says. No, that's not the case at all. And in any situation, if someone tells you something, ask them, well, where is it written at? You say you read that in the Bible, please show me that so I can see. You don't have to be um, mean or anything like that. Just say, please show me where that's written. And so, but yes, um, so those are the verses that document that that's definitely not the case. And I, I want to leave you with one verse. It's Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2. And it says, be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Let's go to our Father's throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your written word in this place you've given us. We can teach your word. 
And we just ask you to continue to give us understanding, not just for ourselves, but so we can share with others. Thank you, and we love you so much, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, amen. This was recorded in the year 2022 at Smyrna Christian Church, Kokomo, Indiana, by Pastor Jesse Sisk. God bless.